I am using computer audio. Okay. Just pence. Um, not. Okay. Hello. Hello, good morning. Oh, I got bad sound. Can you can you say something again? I can hear you. Yeah, good. Okay. Have my, my new world order of computer and all kinds of things in flux here. Ah, here it is. Hi, Ron. Good evening. Hi. Hello. I'm sorry, I might need to uh, join again. I don't have my uh, webcam, so I usually uh, join again through my phone. So. Sure. It's all good. People are oops, going in. Let's see here. Any last minute? Yes, I have another last minute. Hang on, more people. Who else? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Hi. Let me get my chat going here. Um. Oh, let me, let me get the share going, and then uh, people are still kind of pouring in here, uh, and then I'll do the, the usual, the usual start thing. And pick pick a thing, anything. Do. Okay, so I'm throwing out a screen share. Uh, hopefully people can see it. And I'm gonna have to... Oh, Ron's coming back around again. Did you drop, Ron, are you, are you having trouble getting in? Uh, no, I'm good. I'll just, uh, I need to join twice. I'll turn my video shortly. Oh, uh, okay, fine. Uh, yeah. Oh, gosh, another one here. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yes. I wish people would do this. Like, if I send an hour before, and then, you know, I have time to go do this. And now I got people sending me right now. Hey, Cliff, I went in. I'm like, okay, but, you know, everyone gets to wait a second. Uh... Oh, yeah, fine. Let me find this thing. Okay, there's there's the share window. Um Okay, I think no one's piling in at the very moment. So, let me go make sure. I so said Zoom did something weird when I started to share. I can't see my There it is. Okay, great. So, um, so I'm Cliff Click. Uh, this is Coffee Compiler Club. In theory, it is not me uh, uh, 
talking nonstop because my goal was to learn something. So I wanted to bring more people in. Um, this meeting's a little different because I have some material I'm going to share up front that came around from last go round. Um, but maybe next time we're back to the usual format where it's just open discussion. Uh, the, the, the other bits are, um, I run an open mic policy, just, you know, pop your mic and say something, but mute when you're not talking because we have a dozen people now and that's sort of, somewhere between 15 and 20 is sort of the normal level. Um, and you get too many open mics, you get too many, you know, background dogs barking in cars, passing by and whatever. Um, the other thing is I'm recording this. If you don't like that, bail out now. Um, it shows up on, you know, YouTube or Zoom or whatever in an hour or two after the meeting's done, however long it takes to post process things. Uh, so that being said, um, last week's discussion ended up revolving around uh, some work people were doing on the, hang on another guy, uh, we're doing on OpenJDK and uh, C2 and Oracle for doing various kinds of escape analysis. And about a decade ago, I did a very hard look at escape detection at Azul Systems. And we went back and forth for a little while and decided that there was something that we could go talk about in common there that might help folks at, you know, at either OpenJDK, C2, wherever it's being done at, um, you know, make forward progress on escape detection, escape analysis, or at least not fall down the same, you know, rat holes I fell down, plenty of, plenty of potholes. Um, and so there's some learning to be shared here. So I'm, I'm uh, as promoted on Twitter, I'm going to start by rolling through some slides and they're bringing up a, a, a little, little uh, a post analysis debrief paper I wrote to myself a decade ago about what worked and what didn't with the, concept being here that we'll just have some some meat to chew on and then I'll cut all that stuff off and go back to open discussion. Um, and as usual in the first five or 10 minutes more people will probably pop and I'll stop each time somebody comes in and verify and let them in. So uh, is that all everyone all clear with what's going on there? And people can see the slide, the, the very boring slide. We've all seen this before, okay, 10 times before. Okay, here we go. So I'm just gonna roll through. I assume we're at least somewhat experts, so I'm kind of gonna go fast. Um, if you have a question, ask, because if you have a question, surely somebody else does. And you know, if you don't ask a question, you'll never learn, right? So, so you know, and the other thing is, of course, I say something that's wrong or out of date, you know, stop me and whack me on the head because, uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I did this work a long time ago and I made some assumptions and I know that some of them are, are not valid anymore. So I'm all happy to take interrupts. Um, stop me if I'm going too fast. So I don't need to read this too much. Um, one of the things that's not obvious and on a non obvious cost about generational collectors um, is the whole cost of the test and bump versus the actual cost on your caches. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So, um, you know, deallocate, if you have a well working uh, generational GC and a not a huge live set, you can expect a young gen to be extremely cheap to collect. You only walk the live set, assuming the generational assumptions working, most of it's dead, you walk a very tiny bit. Somewhere between milliseconds and microseconds, you have a, a, a young gen done, it's all really cheap. So what really costs you though, is you string through memory and your young gen is much, much larger than your L1 cache. So you flush your cache repeatedly, right? Um, so <clears throat> you can cover some of these cache miss costs. Uh, here, I got another person coming in here. Uh, you can cover some of these cache miss costs with careful prefetching. And Azul has custom hardware to help with cache line prefetching for zeroing that is not fenced the way every other processor on the planet does cache line zeros and they all blow it except Azul and you can't use them as effectively as you can Azul and it's still not good enough. But let's, let's, let's talk about cache line zero fencing at the end if people wanna go there because there's a clear fuck up that was done by three different hardware companies um, that Azul got right and some other people did not. Okay, here's another person whose email I don't know. Um, Zen, let 
Let me let me see if I can find them really quick here, and then I will go back to the usual lecture blah 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 format here. Cliff, I might have sent you a late arrival. You did, and I got you already. Um, no, I mean uh, I, I, another person. Oh, are they gonna they're gonna email me for a, a ticket in? Yeah, possibly. Okay, I got a couple last minute tickets in already. I, I took care of. Uh, yeah. No one's pending right now. Uh, Zinlu, send me maybe private chat your email so I can link your name with your email, your Zoom name with email. Okay, fine. So, so back to Slideware. Um, let, let, let's go look at a picture here um, so people get a clue what, what is the actual cost of GC. And this cost, by the way, when you do sort of streaming through uh, allocations at a very high rate, um, oh, here's more people on the chat. Da, 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 chat. Why is the chat window not open? Uh, <laughs> I have a button that says chat, but it didn't pop a chat window. I will look at the chat window. I'm done sharing. Sharing like screws up all the controls. Um, yeah, so the allocation here, that one of the pattern I'm trying to show here is there's an allocation point to the right is memory that has not been seen by the processor since the last full GC cycle. So it's pretty much guaranteed not in your cache. 100, almost 100% guaranteed not in your cache. To the left of the allocation point, you've just allocated it. You immediately store in zeros. You then store in good data. You usually load data out of the object you just made. And then the object dies young because the generational assumption is working, except for a few hot items. And so as time progresses and you sweeping through memory, things just behind your allocation point in memory are the hottest on average. And further back, it's colder and colder. Right now, the same patterns appearing in your L1 cache, and you can substitute L1, L2 hierarchy cache for identical properties. And as you roll through, you keep filling your, your L1 cache with hot stuff on one side and cold on the other, and a few items that are going to live long term that are hot behind. And you're always reading in these deadlines from memory that are the processor does not avoid reading them. So he brings in dead memory. You promptly zero it in your cache usually incrementally cash line by not 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 necessarily cash line by cash line but if you still do it cash line by cash line uh the modern x86 as far as i know still will read the line from memory even if you entirely zero it before it brings the line back because you don't have a bulk zero and so you do a partial zero and he begins the read and he doesn't stop the read now that he started it and so the line appears and then promptly gets filled with zero so it was a complete waste of memory bandwidth Oh, I was trying to say something about, about big data streaming. If you do fast, high rates of allocation, um, this can be your entire cost of your memory bandwidth consumption and can lead to integer factor slowdowns. Or removing this can lead to integer factor speedups. And I give examples of this in, in the class I show. It is very easy to demonstrate this effect um, because the effect is so freaking dramatic. So as the allocation point streams along, you roll through your L1 cache repeatedly. Now you're throwing out things that are kind of lukewarm and you're keeping maybe a few hot things and it's very hot behind allocation point, but it's pretty cold in front of it. Um, and as you repeat this over and over, you're constantly flushing things out of your L1 now that are mostly dead because the generational assumption mostly works. And you were reading in things that were mostly cold. And so as you endlessly roll through your, your young gen, you're endlessly wiping your L1 cache out by reading in cold dead memory and writing out cold dead memory. Right, and there's a handful of things that live in the L1 that keep getting touched and stick around. Otherwise, you're just like turning it over and over and over again. So the goal of stack allocation, hey, there's another guy I know, Zim. Oh, wait, here the chat window appeared, and I have a bunch of stuff. Let me make sure there's nothing going on here. Da 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 da. -da, -da. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, thank you for the comments. It's all good. I got it. Um, people just swapping emails back and forth um yeah so uh oh we picked up here let me grab a guy just came in okay so so the goal of of stack allocation is basically to cut out this endless caching cache thrashing right reserve space on function entry delocate is in theory free by popping your stack direct costs of bump pointer allocation are similar to generational. Um, and the goal here is to, you know, recycle, uh, recycle things in your L1 or L2 as opposed to constantly turning them out. Another, another attendee here, hang on. 
I get a faster way to do this here. Um, and of course it requires, you know, knowledge of things. So here's the obvious, you know, poster child and we'll get to what happened here is, is round two. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to have uh, some frame on the stack you're going to allocate into. I'm doing direct out in this example, I'm doing direct allocation on the stack. Although in, in, in various attempts I did, I put a, a stack, a separate stack heap off to the side, stack, stack based allocation point off to the side. So there's some bump pointer inside of stacks, Sam's frame. You just bump pointer along as you might expect. You make a new frame for a new function call, which does its own bump. The unwind is free because you just pop your stack and you reclaim that storage. So when you go into Uli, these are like grad student buddies of mine from like long time ago. Um, you, you recycle the memory. So you don't continuously uh, extend through L1 cache, but you're recycling. But you have to have a lifetime management uh, in place or when you exit, you might have left a pointer behind you in the stack that you promptly stomp on the next call. So hopefully it's all obvious to folks what's going on here. So stack allocation has the same kind of fast allocate that you get out of a generational um, and should be cheap free that like you get out of a generational, but better cache behavior. Um, and then, you know, what do you do with that object lifetime? How do you manage object lifetime? So there's the two obvious approaches of which I think I'm the only guy that's done a vigorous attempt at the second one. So the analysis has been around a long time, escape analysis. And this is this precise conservative um, thing that proves that something never escapes. And there's a bunch of variations now that try to extend it because if you do sort of a straightforward, like IBM tried a straightforward very aggressive global large scale escape analysis and discovered that they couldn't get shit that that, that, that it, too many things happen too conservatively too quick and they could not get a reasonable amount of things to analyze their stack lifetimes one of the issues is is that in fact things did not have stack lifetimes but the fail path where you escaped out of a method could be extremely rare say only on an exception throw which wasn't ever happening on this run of the program so the other one is escape detection, where you look at every point that you would escape and see if it in fact does escape. And if it does not, then in practice, it is still stack local. And if it does escape, you have to do some expensive fix up. So you need a, a, a read barrier or write barrier, write barrier, um, and a fix up path. Cliff? Yeah. Um, just a question on um, on the on the escape analysis. Like, if you get a deopt um, after you've done a stack allocation, um, and the deopt actually ca would cause the allocation to fail escape analysis, um, do you, you have, have to repack? You have to repack the object. Yeah. You have to repack everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is this is escape to tech escape analysis where you claim D ops do not escape, which is a totally valid improvement over the base one that IBM did um, just has the issue that then the assumption is you're going to the interpreter. Well, you are going to go to the interpreter and you don't know what's happening now. The reason you're deopting is because you're about to execute new code you've never seen before because somebody loaded a new stack, a new class and you loaded that pointer and you're about to execute it. And you're like, screwed. Ah, I'm taking a virtual call to God knows where. So your analysis did not include that new code, so you give it up. You say, ah, bail out, and you repack the object, throw it in the heap. And, and just a question on a previous slide. Um, have you been finding that like uh, mark phases are dominated by uh, cache miss? Um, GC, in a background GC, the, the various kinds of marking phases are all done by background threads, and they burn they burn bandwidth, but in the background. So if your your uh, concurrent collector, if you're not out of bandwidth overall, and your current collector is actually being concurrent, it burns bandwidth you don't care about. So it does consume cycles, but not where you care. That that's the theory on a background collector. If you have enough bandwidth running around, which is to say, if you keep adding cores, you're going to be in trouble. Yes. So, so one of the things Azul had was the the magical property of having like fuck ton of bandwidth, like a supercomputer. Like we were in the top top 100 supercomputers for a while for bandwidth, top 15 or 20s, like pretty high up there. Um, went with the crazy high count of cores. You know, an x86 these days might handle uh, 20 or 30. I don't know what the number is. Outstanding misses at a time, and a Azul box would handle uh, a thousand 
thousands of outstanding memory misses at a time. So, so very large number. So background collector, free on a Zool box because you got bandwidth spare. On an XA6, you're a little tighter. You're probably okay unless you're doing one of these uh, allocation, extremely allocation heavy patterns like my canonical examples, I'm reading, a, I'm doing machine learning on a big data fintech set. I'm reading a couple gigabytes of CSV file and breaking it up into strings and parsing the crap out of it. Okay, the act of breaking up the strings and using read line to go read it blows my bandwidth by five to one or 10 to one. And getting rid of that notion of parsing by bringing it into a string saves me like 10x bandwidth, gets me a 5x speed up, integer factor 5x speed up because I have completely saturated an x86's bandwidth available in one core. So yes, you can totally run an x86 out of bandwidth and, and then your background collector is, is competing resource wise with your foreground mutators. Yep. I have a question. If, if the garbage collection running in the background and is basically probably also always not using caches, isn't it thrashing the caches for the foreground mutators? Right. So again, what we did at Azul is we threw the background collectors on a private cluster. So they had a private L2 that they thrashed the shit out of. Uh, I don't know what, you know, the different concurrent collectors are doing on, uh, on Oracle and OpenJDK. I know the Azul collector has messed around with this repeatedly. I don't know if what the x86 Azul collector is doing. Um, although I know we tried hard and we have the, you know, built in, we have baked in the, the ability in the GC itself, but you have to have OS uh, cooperation to say pin this guy to uh, you know, a, a different cluster from that guy. So I can comment on ZGC and some of the visualizations I've been doing. Um, and it looks like we're getting like about a 20x allocation throughput hit uh, with when ZGC is running concurrently for when it's out of cycle or out of, out of epoch. Wow. Wow. Like 20x more slow, slow down on the mutators or 20x? I mean, that's like, like my bother. Well, the allocation rates are about uh, 20x, um, the, the reduced by about a factor of 20x. Okay. <laughs> I know the Azul collector doesn't do, like, like it, it barely touches the mutators while it's running. And it, and it basically runs all the time because that's how it's geared to run. I mean, it has, you run it when generational, it has on off cycles. It doesn't run all the time, but you know, it burns a core or two pretty frequently um on another l2 in theory you know if you can do it um this is from a very that. limited data set so right, I'll, fine. Put, I'll put that uh caveat in, in there but um i think one of the applications i used you've actually ran it on the azul hardware we got we're getting like 40 gigabytes of garbage per second or something wacky like that okay yeah an, a, an old azul box a decade old azul box would do 40 gigs a second without blinking an eye uh, you know, modern x86 variation, I believe will do that as well. Um, but I don't know, you know, you're, you're hitting bandwidth issues at some point. Generally, you tap at about, in a Java application, you start tapping at about eight gigs per second. Right. And the, the standard, uh, as of, uh, as of uh, some generations ago, the bandwidth domain memory on an x86 flat out was like 50 gigs a second. Um, I don't know what that number is these days, but that's not too old. So those numbers, those ratios are right. What you're saying is, is about right. Assuming there's all kinds of other crap running around at the same time, I could totally buy that. All right, let me, let me roll through this um, a little more, but that's an interesting, you know, bandwidth. Th this is all about saving bandwidth, right? Okay, that's one of the goals here is to save bandwidth. Okay, um, I, everyone's read the slide, right? We like 15 minutes over. Okay, going on. Um, so so I, I came in with escape detection hardware. Eventually, um, we got figured out how to do this in software on an x86 with acceptable cost. So let's pretend that we have an x86 variation of uh, uh, the detection, and we can argue fine details of how you might want to go there. Um, but it's only interested if you're already interested in doing this approach. But you might want to see what the trade-offs are before you, you know, whatever, fine. So, um, the, the, the Azul technique was uh, steal some bits from your address. 
And the, the original hardware actually had a lot of good, a lot of flexibility and a lot of strength to it. Um, it wasn't necessary in the end. So I, I'm missing what the hardware does, but that's not necessary for what I later ended up using with good effect. Um, but basically, every time you did a, a, a store, he would do a, a check to see if the thing being stored and the thing being stored into uh, had compatible uh, address spaces. So if you were a young gen to old gen on the heap, you would get a trap. If you were same gen to same gen, you were good. If you were stack to heap or stack to stack with different frame IDs, you would get a, you would get a fix up. Um, and then you had to do something. You get a trap, user mode trap, go fix it up. The x86 variation involves taking your pointers and doing something to both of them and then doing a branch that is highly predictable. So it's a little bit of integer math and a jump. It can be done in one or two clock cycles. It's similar costs, a little bit more expensive to a filtering write barrier. The fix up on the other hand had to do something expensive. So you need it to be rare. Right, so, so fix up was basically, you know, copy an object from the stack to the heap and all the pointers to it had to be found and redirected. And that might have been recursively escaping other things. So, so you had to deal with it. Um, factory objects always escape at least one level. Often there's a long train of, of calls, call, 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 return, 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 and that, that you have to handle. So it turned out that if I tagged allocation sites with the relative allocation depth and count of function call invocations at the bytecode level, not the compiler level, um, that I had a rapid convergence of how high up the stack I needed to allocate so something would have an actual stack lifetime. Uh, and, and it was sufficient to simply start small and you fail, bump the allocation up uh, and, and you rapidly converged. So this was a not a known property and, and discovering this was like really cool. What it meant was after I ran a little while and converged, I rarely had to do fix ups and I had the correct depth discovered from where you allocated to where you quit escaping, All right? So that was a key, key takeaway. There is such a point and statistically speaking, some of them always escaped all the time. Some of them escaped extremely rarely, but they did. Uh, and some never did once you got past depth in where in could be determined at runtime by simply counting fails. Okay, same game happens on the frames. As you saw, I did my, here's Sam and Ted and Uli, and how big were those frames that could take things, right? So when I did my bump pointer, I had to check for overflow. And if it fits, you're great. And if it doesn't, I threw you off to the side and I recorded something. So I had a stack running the sides. I had two stacks of the main stack doing its stack thing. I had a, a, an allocation stack that mirrored in that there was a frame alignment between it up and down, but there were holes in this one where I could allocate things. Um, and I had to adjust my prologue and epilogue code to make the frame off the side or remove it as necessary or whatever you're gonna do there. Again, the size of that frame converged rapidly in practice you typically allocated X objects or X bytes worth of objects within this frame and all his nested friends. And so once you were at depth, your size 1K or 200 bytes or whatever it was, you quit failing the size check. So you would actually change the code in the code segment? Yeah. Now, it's actually, it's, it's Hotspot does yeah, yeah. modify code all the time. Well, I'm just thinking over the NX and the fact that you're already in the code on at least one thread. Same issue as you're doing inline cache updates, right? It, you're doing self-modifying code with multiple racing threads. They all can mutate the, the thing all at the same time. They all can read any partial updates from anyone else. How do you deal with it, right? So, so this is sort of a solved problem from Hotspot's point of view. It's a pain in the butt, but there's infrastructure in place to do self-modifying code in a sensible way with in the face of racing threads. In this case, the only thing that happened here was I bumped a size constant of the, how big a frame I, I popped, right? And so if I, somebody didn't see the bump, they got a small frame and then they went to the overflow area. If somebody did see the bump, they got the bigger frame and they had more space. And then, you know, it was safe to, to do it, uh, eat both up and down because the running guy first, before he did any allocations, he made a frame and then he tested did his frame meet his needs? 
So in fact, it would, it could in theory go both up and down if everyone is only growing, but somebody is growing slower than somebody else and you had a race, you would do that. Now, that's the theory in practice, of course, as soon as I'm doing self-modifying code, if there's any sensible way to take a walk, I fucking take a walk and the only one guy's whacking the thing at a time. But the mutators that are reading, read on the fly. They don't take any lock at the stack frame. So they could get whatever size. So in fact, it only bumps monotonically forward. Um, but only one guy really whacked it at a time here. The, the inline caches were done with uh, CAS instructions and they totally could have multiple guys whacking them at the same time. It's a little more tricky. So there were a bunch of issues that came out of this. So some top level frames never exit. You just get a, a loop over a, you know, uh, uh, anybody's top level, whatever web server, server, server loop. Um, because it uh, never exits, objects accumulate. Um, so you actually need a thread local GC. And you generally needed a thread local GC anyhow. Um, sometimes the thread local GC was a great chance to adjust frame sizes that were constantly too small or too big on frames that weren't going away and you can make them bigger or smaller or whatever as well. Um, as part of the, the next order of, uh, of statistics collection of profiling data, your, your allocation sites can depend on, you know, your inlining path, right? And you get different tags for different depths because people have inlining uh, different things and then they get different allocation behaviors based on what they did. So inlining clones your allocation sites along private paths and you wanted your own depth tag for every inlined copy because you wanted private statistics for that particular path because it would behave differently. Um, and then the reverse helps as well. The, one of the things is because I know I'm strongly, uh, strongly normalizing, I can read the tags at jitting time and I can say, uh, well, this guy escapes up to here. So if I start here or higher and I include him, he never escapes at this point. That's empirically never escapes. So now run an escape analysis because maybe it'll work. And the difference between a detection and analysis is of course analysis is perfect. If it got it, it got it. It never escapes. I don't have to do any testing on that object. I can in register it. I can do all kinds of you know, goodness and light to it. Um, but if it fails, I still know that empirically I'm not failing out of this point, not escaping out of this point. And so I can make a frame in the jitted frame that's big enough to take that allocation object sort of directly. Um, and so this is the first set of results from pass one plus it's, you know, success and fails. The paper that comes up in a second is pass two successes and fails and, and discusses what I'm doing with pass three. So the end of pass one is I could run, uh, you know, reasonably big size tests, get about half of all objects stack allocated. I needed some overflow area that was big enough to handle stuff. I needed to do stack TCs periodically. They were pretty quick. I had a bunch of anomalies that led to potholes that caused things to get bad fast. And so it wasn't ready for prime time in that sense. So if I make a big object on the stack, um, there were a lot of cases where people would make a large object, a large array and use a tiny prefix of it and then throw it away. They would go, hey, go make a, 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 I don't know, byte buffer or whatever, buffered reader, writer, whatever the hell, and it allocated an 8K buffer, which they promptly printed hello world in and we're done. And they used 10 bytes. Um, sucked. So, uh, you know, it might be faster to do heap allocation for that because we had fast zeroing hardware. Might be faster to do you know, some other techniques here. I'm gonna have to, I don't know, somebody started a chainsaw out my window. All right, fine. Audio is not coming through. The audio is not coming through. Yeah, no chainsaw. Oh, oh the chainsaw is not coming through. Okay, fine. Um, I can hear it. That's, it's, <laughs> um, so the other thing would be like, I get frames that got very large very quickly because of one bad allocation that was uncommon. Um, and the other, you know, other big one is I would allocate uh, in a loop which is pretty common. And that's exactly the case you wanted to, to clean up, but I wasn't popping frames. I didn't have a frame per loop. So I wasn't popping, I wasn't restoring the allocation every trip to the loop. So you would run the loop and out and, and just accumulate all that stuff the entire duration of the loop execution. And then when you exited the method, you would reclaim it all. And that wasn't the right pattern. You wanted to reclaim in a loop. 
Um, so let's see here. I'll talk. Oh, here I am talking about uh, doing this in x86 software just by comparing raw stack addresses and trapping. Yeah, well, let's not go here, but we can. There's some, there's some things, it depends on how flexible you are. At Azul, we got pretty good about resorting, relaying out address spaces because we did it all the time. We had OS support for, you know, what to do with your address bits. Um, and that let us carefully arrange your stacks to be aligned in such a way that I could do a cheap ass test and know that you had escaped or not. But you know, one one instruction compare two pointers and blow. Um, da 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 da. And summary done. Okay, so that's like end of slides. So good time to go Q and A. What what this is before round two here. And if not, I'm going to set this aside and I'm going to bring up the paper here. So you had mentioned, I think last week, the thing with the loop. Yeah. And you had basically made the loop body treated as if it were its own frame or something like that. Was, yeah, that's, that's round Did two. I remember correctly? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to do something. Okay, so let me, let me bring up next round here and, and make sure I'm not lying. Because I know I, I, I thought about it hard. Da, 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 da. And I had a plan. And okay, that's not related. And I lost my thing. Here it goes. And that is not what I'm looking for. So closer. This. Oh, come on. Yeah, it's a new machine in all ways. And so every possible Windows thing demands that it can be ownership of things that it never, whatever, fine. What's Windows? Exactly. Sorry, I've been using Windows for too long to conveniently share, to conveniently switch. So, you know, my life sucks. I, I, I've certainly done lots of coding on Linux. Okay, so hopefully people can see this. Um, this is hard reading. I sent it out on the link. So mostly I'm going to not read aloud and not expect you to read it, but I'm going to pull out some, you know, tidbits of like wisdom out of here. Um, motivation, hardware support, da, 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 da. escape events, SBA round one. So let's go to successes and fails of round one, which we just kind of went through. So basically it all worked. Um, not only did we d d figure out that the, the allocation hints were strongly normalizing, like 95% or 99%, um, the hint is zero, one, two, or heat. That is, you're out, you, you, you don't escape this frame or the one or two frames above you or you went to the heat, right? Um, and this is for jitted code. So the jitting inlined a lot of factories just straight up and, and cleaned up a lot of the things that you might have issues with there, uh, but didn't quite get it always because we weren't looking at these hints at that time. Is that a post inline zero, one or two? Yeah, po post inlining zero, one, two, which means that if we had looked at the hint during inlining, we could probably have gotten the one and the two and been done with it, right? Um, so the next issue is that performance was actually fairly lousy despite having half of all objects stack allocated, which we got down to a couple different places. Um, pathological examples with high escape rates, uh, and there, these would be, these would be um, various kinds of benchmarks that started out by allocating uh, uh, an array of objects at a particular depth and then walking them and escaping them up one level. So they were all just made in the wrong depth by one, which at that time required a fix up per object that involved copying the whole object. Um, were, those, uh, were those fat arrays? They were just arrays of pointers to objects. So the object- Had, the had they been- if they were fat arrays, would it have avoided that? Um, it would have moved the whole array and have escaped all the embedded objects all in one shot, which would have been a cheaper cost. Now, the, the proper way to escape the objects is to change the pointer contents without moving the object in order to declare it to be a, a one higher up in the frames. You have to do, do something to declare this object higher. The, the various techniques I've been using were like, I had a, a if you were a stack object, I knew it because of where you landed in the general address space and your 
frame depth and who you belong to and shit like that was kept in a pre-word prior to the object. So if I wanted to move you, I could just leave you in place and change your pre-word. So there was a way to move you, but it wasn't happening at this first juncture. We, 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 we actually up and copied objects. Um, the, the, the next thing was that these frames uh, were close, the concept was close, but th there was a, 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 there's a, there's a call depth thing going along and the frame IDs counted from the, the root, the, 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 the main start method and went down, but the allocation lifetime was relative to the bottom, but the leaf changed height depending on how much shit was above it. So counting frame IDs from the wrong end was blew it. Frame IDs were not the right answer when counted from that direction. I needed to count depth from the, the deepest you're gonna go down going upwards. And that's sort of a different way to, to think about counting. Like usually I you know, look at counting stack frames, I'm starting at start and counting down. If I look at my debugger and I'd have a stack overflow exception, he counts frames for me and he says, you have so many frames, but the zero frame is the thread at start and one, two, three in up to 2000 or whatever the overflow is. Wrong thing for stack allocation, you wanna count from the other end. Uh, okay, so, so that's sort of, of reasonable discussion on round one. So round two, um, I did a complete rewrite. This is always a common pattern for me is I let a junior engineer do the first cut because there are mistakes that are gonna be made by everybody and he'll make them just as well as I am and he gets to learn a whole lot. But round two, I really wanted it to work and I took it myself and tried very, very hard. Um, and I got a lot of good things out of it and didn't quite get enough. Um, the, the, you know, I, I, the frames resized well, um, that, that moved most things off the main stack because that way I didn't have to copy objects if I had to escape them up or down a frame. I could leave them in place and just diddle headers. Uh, the, the, the there was still an allocation instruction that had to change in the header, but that just meant you were bumping the side array. There's a second, you know, the side stack, basically. Um, the round two, I got closer to 70%, 70, 75% of all objects stack allocatable in running like JBoss and big, big heavy web spheres. So, so not your standard benchmarks, but long lifetime running, like hours and hours running of big heavy web servers under heavy load. Um, we would still get uh, large inline frames that would blow the usefulness of keeping them stack local, keeping them in, inside your cache. And that would just happen because somebody's gonna make a big, big array. And the first time you make a big array, it starts stack local, it didn't escape yet. Um, and so you make it on your local stack, however that's done. And then later you escape it to the heap because that's what was going on or whatever it's gonna be escaping to. Um, the, the large objects wanted the faster allocation path that the main GC totally supported. In particular, if you went to the very large object route, the main GC would play all kinds of fun tricks. The same as I think the Oracle GCs do. Uh, there's a large object space, objects don't move. Um, we actually cheated with TLBs to, <clears throat> if you weren't filling in all the object, you would lazily zero the, using TLB misses to, to watch and guard things. You couldn't do that on the stack stuff. Um, the stack local GC had to run a lot. It wasn't background, it ran in the foreground. Um, a one generational collector was not good enough. I needed to be multi-generational. And in theory, you would want sort of a generation per frame, kind of. The lower frames came and went pretty quickly and you didn't care. But as soon as you had frames that were living around for a while, um, but they were not infinite, they were just slow to exit, you wanted to generational collect them, not every time collect them. Um, we, we did get more things fitting in L, well, not L1, because our L1's too small, but L2s. But it wasn't enough to make up for both the lack of using the good cache line zero for high, large optic allocations. Um, and it wasn't enough to make up for not having a background GC, really. Oh, I have another person uh, 
who I don't recognize at all. Let me go see. So the one thing I would watch out for is I've had spam bots come in. Mr. Kazkaz, send me a private chat, please, with your email. Um, and so sort of, sort of it's winding down what I learned out of doing this. You, you weren't going to win against the background collector unless you were really aggressively good in all directions. Um, you can't have too many pitfalls or pit holes or whatever. Our CLZ instruction, which x86 does not have, essentially removed the, the cost to read a dead object into, into cache. So if you're already in the cache, you didn't want to use it. But if you're not in cache, you did, and using it saved you the read cost. And x86 is going to read it all the time, and so will win more if you can live in his cache. And his L2s are much, much larger than Azul's L2s. So there really is some bandwidth to be saved by having uh, objects allocated on the stack successfully, even if you are still having to zero them, you know, sort of the hard way, which x86 has been doing ever all along. It's all fine. Um, I think round three is where I started doing the loop thing because I recognized that I had to have, this goes into the, the concept of having a frame that lives a long time. Because the frame lives a long time uh, with a lot of allocation, you had to GC it a lot. And you would rather have had the GC happen at the lifetime exit, which in a loop was typically one or two trips around the back edge, depending on how the loop unrolled. If you unrolled it enough, one trip around the back edge would clean up all the objects except the half life, which would die on the next iteration. So, so usually you get a, you did get guys that went once per loop, but you also had hand over hand things all the time. And so you, you had to handle hand over hand in a loop, not too much more grief. Um, and that's sort of, you know, the end of my canned presentation. And I kind of, you know, open it up for, there's a whole lot of discussion about how I'm designing round three, which I didn't get to the, the cleanup afterwards of round three, because somewhere while doing the effort in round three, I decided I wasn't going to beat the background collector on Azul hardware, and I, and I quit trying. So a couple of hypothetical questions. If you had, for example, uh, limited the, uh, the depth that you would stack allocate from, you know, so the kind of the, the, uh, the, the put a max limit on the. Yeah, uh, I know what you're talking about. Could that have been kind of like a simple heuristic for avoiding some of the, the downsides that you hit? So as soon as you escape something to the heap, my assumption was everybody else that he can reach goes to the heap as well. So you couldn't take these objects that were very high up in the stack near, near the start frame and throw them in the heap because they always had down pointers. And then you would end up flushing everything to the heap. You had to have even if even if they hadn't escaped the thread, or did you have that? Right, no, no. So because they didn't escape the thread, so you allocated them in thread storage, right? And they lived a long time in thread storage. This is where I wanted to keep them in thread storage, not on the thread main stack, but in a side stack that was thread storage stack, where I would use uh, presumably a generational collector to recognize that they both. <laughs> were still thread local, but also hadn't moved or changed in the forever and a day, and I didn't need to go walk them. But they had pointers into the down folks, and if those pointers went to the heap, the downside, you know, the, the guys where you were making progress had to go. So somebody up high got allocated a service object, and he had pointers into the currently executing web frame, web request. That service object never moved, and once in a while, the service thing task item changed what he was working on. But if you put him in the heap, he blew the entire web request, went to the heap. So you had to keep him thread local. So there, there was this tension where I wanted to just not deal and let the background GC do it, but I couldn't throw it in the heap or I drag over all his, you know, Lay's potato chips. You can't just eat just one, right? All his friends went with him, and those are the friends you wanted to keep around that you, were, you wanted to do thread local on.
You could also, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to uh, kill a, a cheap one here. You could also do stack cheating, uh, stack lock cheating on thread local objects, which I totally did and wasn't worth anything. Basically, an uncontended lock is really, really cheap, unless the JIT can get rid of back-to-back -back lock and lock attempts and then optimize through them, that's the only gain you're gonna get on, on not locking stack objects. We totally took the shortcut. Hey, it's stack, don't bother to lock. And nothing. I had a question about, um, maybe something that actually is happening with maybe the Graal jet right now, to some extent. Did you ever try to see if it was detected by the right barrier that it was now escaping to just de-opt and let it recompile with a flag say, do not stack allocate this candidate here ever. Yeah, yeah totally. So this goes to the hints, right? Okay. If, somebody, if somebody was allocating successfully for a little while and they escaped, I had to look at the ratio of fail to success. Because one fail, you know, was so evil that it covered up the wins from 10 successes, right? So you had to make up a ratio in your head of success to fail, and then you blew it. And, you, and you know, at some point, you, the, the ratio went too far, and you said no. Hmm. Um, in the case of DOP, if DOP events were rare, and sort of by definition, they are after you normalize, yeah. um, I, I often didn't bump the heuristics very much. Like something else de-opted this heuristic of stack allocation is fine. This object gets shoved into the heap for being escaped for de -opt, And I don't know what the hell is going on with it. But otherwise, the, the current set of allocation heuristics are working for the current object uh, in JIT compilation. So I'll just leave them alone. Mm -hmm. So, so de -opt wasn't necessarily a, a killer. I really counted escapes and counted non-escapes uh, some way. You, know, you had to you know, cheat my way to counting escapes and non-escapes. Because you right. couldn't count non-escapes too much because that counting was more expensive than actually you know, <laughs> doing the object and registering or whatever. Right? Well, I think the case was, uh, was escape through deopt. I think it's ha handled even by OpenJDK escape analysis was uh, late materialization in deopt handler. Because mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have a deopt, and you manage to scalarize, you would have lazy materialized representation in the deop handler. And if you take the deop, you materialize, materialize the object and essentially escape it. And probably in next that I compile, you will not have a deop there. You would inline the code uh, corresponding. And probably this will prevent escape analysis, or you would analyze this piece of code uh, after recompilation as well. So I think this kind of works uh, on, on hotspot today. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Certainly the case that the, the deop path had to rematerialize the object. I think that the main goal here of the escape detection versus analysis was to say, this path happens, but it's extremely rare. I'll just leave the object unless I take this path and then you'd escape of the detection and inflate it. And if that ratio of you know, rareness was rare enough, you would still win. I'm still they, stuck trying to think through the example you gave with the uh you know, the, the container object escaping, or not escaping, but being promoted to the, the thread local heap, if there were still some, because that sounds like a huge win, if you could find some way to let the container or the, the upstream escape to the heap. And the thread local heap. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I maintained essentially a thread local heap that I broke up into, the, the round three was breaking it up into thread local but, heap, and not thread local heap. Right, but without having to uh, drag everything with it. That's the... Um, it doesn't. No, thread local, thread local heaps do not, or not heaps. That's not an escape. Nothing got drugged. Even out of the, even if they were allocated in the back frames? Yeah, that, that, that was the point. They, they, I wanted to get to a generational collector. The generations were basically, you're on a stack thing or you're a thread local. The, the thread local had pointers into the stack. Those were done with the sort of classic right barrier kind of technologies if you were changing them. Um, the stack came and went and came and went and, and pointers escaped from thread local into deeper into the stack. That was okay, if that makes sense, without raising the stack up. But that one had to be guarded with a, a right barrier test. Um, 
but I didn't move it from thread local to the main heap. That was, that was, that was what I was trying to dodge on a, on a deopt. The problem with the deopt is you don't know what's coming next. And so maybe it is supposed to go to the main heap. So the deopt. Right. So if it goes to the multi-threaded heap, yeah, you have to drag everything. Got yeah. that. And then on the hand over hand example, um, is, is the issue there that, you know, basically you only have two deep in terms of what would have to stay in the frame, kind of the, the, uh, current and previous, for example? Yeah, there's two lifetimes. You would have a lot more objects, right? So the issue is the loop inline all kinds of crappy shit that allocate all kind of crappy strings doing crappy shit, fine. Or a linked list that it's going through and it's a billion long, right? It, or, whatever that, well, yeah, right. So, so the, 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 yes, so it's doing something stupid here. But if, if in fact the lifetimes were ending on the loop iteration, if it wasn't ending forever, you just had a growing life set, you died no matter what you did, right? So, so that was not the case, you were ending um, your life, the lifetime of everything could be shown with detection to be not longer than one iteration, but usually there was some one and a half iteration li lifetime. Right. Like, right. So if you could tell the JIT this and the JIT would unroll the loop, then it would come around to being that the half lifetime would get an ever smaller fraction of the total lifetime, but you still had to handle the case that not everyone died at the end of the loop. There was always one guy, and and and, if and how common how common was this? Because it sounds like you hit this a lot. I, it was common enough. That's what I remember. It, it was like too often. I had I had to deal, because the, the issue is I had some space for the loop. The loop would allocate at the end. It would re reset. That's the goal. What really happens? He would allocate to the end, have a half object, he had to copy to the start, and then he'd allocate again, and that this one was alive and that one was dead, and then you copied him to the start. So you're always like shuffling some shit. To make that shit shuffle work, you had to have this be big enough relative to this, or you had to have a ring buffer or some kind of game going on. Yeah, and a I ring buffer like a, you know, and one ring buffer, mod two, right? But just saying, you had to have something in there that I didn't get to. I got to where I had to copy this little turd over to make it go again. And if that turd was small enough, I would win. If it was big enough, I lost. And I, I, you know, somewhere around in there, I was running out of time for infinitely twisting heuristics to make it go. Nonetheless, you had to deal with loops. That was one of the learnings. And another thing, if you want to analyze and uh, analyze this kind of situation, you can drive unrolling, partial unrolling, uh, based on this heuristic, and then you don't have to deal with it. In, I, in I, I knew I could do it with partial unrolling, and I did not get there. That would be the better answer. And, and Hotspot totally does partial enrolling for all kinds of other checks. Yeah. And removing like, uh, 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 what the hell, the, the, the damn ill-structured loops. This is a senior moment, I'm forgetting my name here. But yeah, loops with multi-entries. You would, you would partial peel and make them single entry. But this one needed a different peel. But if you peeled it that way, you, you, could, you could get a win there. Yeah, and, and it will be beneficial both for detection, stack allocation, for analysis, like in general, looks like a good thing to do. Yeah. So, so I think that the main things that an x86, uh, you know, OpenJDK needs to think about is how to do that write barrier with acceptable cost, um, which has to have a, you know, branch to fail if you failed the, the pointer pointy relationship. Um, if you can guarantee happy happiness on the uh, stack address bits versus the heap address bits, you can probably get away with like a Zor bit test thing. Zor the two pointers test one bit or some set of bit with an x86 bit test jump to rare fail. And he'd happily run that in the background and predict on it and do the right things and it'd be cheap enough. That was, that was, you know, that was, that was the game that Zool got away with. We, we allocated all our stacks on, even on the x86 one, they're all allocated on, against a fixed, very high set of zeros address space when two make boundaries. So I can get you a stack base by shifting right by 20. Um, there's one TLB that covers them all. You can do fractional small TLBs for doing thread local storage areas and a bunch of fun games that come out of that. Um, but one of them was, I guaranteed you the heap and the stacks had a nice address relationship. So you could just do some bit test and discover some cheap bit test and discover that you had an escape.
Ron, you look like you're just like puzzling through. Uh, no, no, I uh, just, uh, uh, I'm wondering, yeah, maybe I can say a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, completely separate. So by far the uh, more important question here is, should we do any sort of stack allocation? I'm not going to try to answer it. The answer is very likely no, but for reasons, but let the, 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 the questions that we can talk well, who about. Who do you work for? So where do you say not likely? Yes. Um, is this open JDK or is no, this open? I work in open JDK, yeah. Uh, well, it, it, uh, uh, and, and some of the reason is, uh, is like you, uh, like you discovered yourself, is that the uh, new collectors are actually quite hard to beat. Yeah. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, this, other, is about, this is about saving memory bandwidth. Whereas an x86 has more cycles and less memory bandwidth than an Azul box by, by a long shot. Sure, but then the question is uh, cost benefit. You know, how much you gain, how much, you, how much does it cost you? Uh, and the other thing is that the, we know that the allocation patterns are going, one thing that you couldn't do at Azul, but we can do in you know, JDK is change the way people write Java code. Uh, and that's going, to change, that's going to change with Valhalla quite significantly. It, However, there are some things that we could do, and uh, I, I think for now the, the more the more interesting question is: suppose we want to do something, how would we do it? Uh, and uh, I think uh, Nicola and uh, um, here here is a different question that I think you need to answer before you go and answering if we could what we could, what goes on. I think you need to answer what is the absolute best possible gain that you could ever hope if everything worked. And if that's too low, then you just, you know, abort. And that right. can be, that well, can that, be tested. By although the that depends on the effort, right? If the effort is, if, if you know, if it's uh, uh, three months worth of work, then it's fine to gain little. Right. Uh, right. So, so I'm saying, yes. So, so what, what is the upper bound here? If the assumption is you're never going to gain on clock cycles directly, but you're going to gain on bandwidth, you should go count your bandwidth with hardware performance counters and decide that if I were to say, cut my bandwidth costs in half, would I gain? So what's the best possible scenario? Suppose I cut my bandwidth costs in half. What am I gonna gain in overall performance? Right. Uh, of course, that, Sorry. Uh, uh, one thing to so, say, uh, the, the proposal, one of the, the proposals that, uh, that's in front of us, uh, the one from Nicola and uh, what's the other, uh, Charlie, um, what they uh, uh, what they propose is something less ambitious than what you showed us. And in fact, we often prefer more ambitious things. Uh, but uh, uh, in in some situations, something that's more ambitious has a better chance of happening. But uh, um, so uh, what they propose is uh, when everything is in line, uh, and in some situations. Uh, Scalar replacement can't happen because uh, they give the canonical example of the uh, uh, cached uh, integer instances um, where you can either allocate or get it from the cache. In that case, you have, uh, I don't, you compile people, what do you call a uh, fine fi node? Yeah. Right? You, you, get, you get the uh, choice. Uh, the oop from yeah. po two possible locations, and only one of them is allocating. Uh, and, and that's when you do. Uh, uh, stack allocation, and that's quite easy to do. Uh, but now we get to some limitations, and I have a proposal, if that's worthwhile, and I, I don't know uh, if it is, but supposing it is, um, I mentioned, so I, I, uh, I run Project Loom, and one of the things we do there is that we copy stacks around, in fact, portions of stacks. Um, theoretically, that can happen, so uh, for the, it, internal pointers are problematic for us. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so when can this happen? Theoretically, that could happen at any safe point. Uh, but uh, in most safe point points, we go to a slow path. Uh, it could only hope, uh, happen in, at an arbitrary safe point if we um, forcefully preempt your lightweight thread, and that should be extremely rare, if ever. Uh, normally, uh, you're preempted at a method call, a physical call. Uh, 
Um, so that means that internal pointers can't live beyond a method call. Uh, that is not in itself a blocker because what you could do, the problem is when, what happens when you spill. So, so, right? so the, the issue that I'm hearing you say is I have internal pointers problematic and therefore I cannot have them. Um, one of the things you get out of doing the escape detection is that you can tell an internal pointer by a, a cheap glance. Ah, so well, hang on. So we, we can't do, we, uh, so uh, when we copy the stack uh, on the fast path, we, what we do is uh, we, d we just do a mem copy and yeah. we don't want to look at anything. Uh, I see, uh, okay, fine. Even, even uh, examining a single byte of the stack is too much. Uh, okay. like, yeah. Um, but, and, and, right. And, and, and again, this does not directly negate stack allocation. It just means you just have pointers to the stack space and just stick the round. You don't, you don't have no. stack internal pointers. You have pointers to an unrelated frame that you're not copying. Or, or what you could do is that in those situations, uh, because we're now talking about, so this proposal, as opposed uh, to what Cliff uh, presented, uh, only does the stack allocation where everything is in the same end method, in the same compilation, in the same unit, uh, then you know everything there is to know about your pointers. You know, um, and in that case, when you spill a register that could point into the stack, uh, you could spill something else, right? You could uh, say this is an offset from SP. Um, it's, not, it's not necessary. Uh, literally not necessary. You just have you have two stacks, one that you're going to mem copy that an x86 is going to grind on directly, and you have your allocation stacks off to the ah. side, and you have pointers from here to here, but never never this way. Right, but that, that could be a, a, a harder problem because there, uh, so what happens, so, but now you have a million threads, so they each have their own, their own allocation stack. Yeah, right. How, yeah, how big are these, these little guys off to the side, yeah. They better not get very big, or you got a million live objects that are each allocating a million bytes, and you've got, you know, gigabytes or terabytes of storage allocation. But that's just, you know, if you didn't have stack allocation, you put them all in the heap, and your heap's going to die, too. So that doesn't matter. Right. So, okay, so, so that's one way. Uh, um, another problem would be, uh, so, so, but let me propose something else entirely and just say that in those cases where we have the, the this um, finite thing happening, uh, we just do stack, uh, we just do scalar replacement and on the branch, on the entry that goes, that does not allocate, that reads an object, say from the heap or from a, an argument, we just copy the object to the scalar replacement. And we continue the rest of the rest of the code uh, with scalar replacement. So we just increase the number of cases where we do scalar replacement, and we do the special thing uh, on the non-allocating path. That's but, where we add the copying. For, for your the, canonical example, you should just like cheat the shit out of it in the compiler because th this one doesn't need anything fancy. I, I totally cheated the shit out of it in the compiler. Ah, oh, this was an integer cache thereof. I mean, I made sure it was an integer. Did, did the right things with it, but. I, I look and said, great, but, you had an object, you didn't, I'm going to fake it until I can fake it all the way. And, right, you know, and that particular case is going to go away with Valhalla. That case goes away, right, right. But there are similar but, kind of cases, but now you have to do statistical math that says, I have so many of these cases that the gain is worth it. Because you can do the integer one, I'm saying, you know, you can cheat your way out of the integer one pretty easily. You, you want to, you still want to be statistically significant on whatever else you're doing. So, so... You know, I don't want to say tell you what to do with your life. Um, do the do the integer hack, get it going, and see what else you can get, and get it going. That's all great, but I didn't think that's that's an independent question of loom threads versus stack allocation. Like I think loom threads and stack allocation can both be done, and they're pretty orthogonal. There's not a whole lot of contention I see here, other than I maybe don't put interior pointers into my stack. I have only one directional to a side thing that doesn't have to get copied. Um, I agree, except then you, you get into starting to manage those mini, those miniature regions. Yeah, and the same as you're managing that, your threads. Yes, but that could be quite a bit of effort. So that becomes okay. another question of, but it's, on the other hand. There's so, no more effort than managing a loom thread plus one pointer, but fine. Um, no, I, I mean in terms, of, in terms of sizing them. 
and uh, yeah. yeah. To... Oh no, no, sizing them, sizing them, it has to happen every time already. And sizing them was what that discussion was about. That there is a known good, there, there is a way to find a known good size pretty directly here. Yeah, so that's that's uh, that's actually uh, yes, I found that very interesting. Um, one, uh, but so so this is so what I'm saying. Uh, just do the scale replacement and copy the object. That that's one cheap trick we can do. But on the other hand, what you were talking about, um, uh, escape detection, that is a completely other thing that could have, uh, in fact, a bigger impact than just. Uh, than just uh, stack allocation. And that is another thing we are actually looking into. Um, that uh, what we can do there is a sort of an, uh, an almost arena-like lecture. So it's an arena, but it could act occasionally have escaping objects. And that arena does not need to be confined to a single thread. And in fact, in code that's written today, uh, you often see uh, certain operations, so uh, let's say you have like an incoming web, re web request and then you're making several outgoing calls on multiple threads. And you know when this whole thing ends, um, especially if we make programmers tell us. Uh, <laughs> but that's different. If you make them tell you, you can get all kinds of good shit going on. If you have to discover it on the fly, that's, that's where it's hard. Yeah, sure, and, and, that, and, that, and that's why it's a bit different because we can say, you know, so, we can do something great if programmers will just tell us and we say, okay, so we change language to make them tell us, right? Yes, so, about, yeah, yeah. And, and is that your intention is to make them change language? Because I will bet you yes. shot hard. In some cases, well, so it's not, so um, in some cases, we do, you, you don't even need to change the language. Uh, if you think about trying resources, um, okay. one of the so things- I'm, I'm wailing on this is because it's not necessary. Uh, it's not necessary. Maybe, right? Maybe. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in all these things, right? So uh, uh, I, I'm just uh, telling bits and pieces I've heard. But uh, uh, we do actually have two people. I see Thomas here and Jorn. Uh, they're on the comp uh, compile team, uh, so uh, they know more about the compile things. But um, uh, yeah, so, so, so some of this may not be necessary, but uh, we, with escape detection, we might be able to do things that are stack allocation-like, but that go beyond a single thread. If we know the extent of a transaction, and when you say it's not necessary, we, we don't need it to be sound. Uh, we can use a hint, and, and that's why we don't necessarily need to change the language. Uh, in fact, what we did now is just change a library. We made uh, the executor service and auto closable. And we have a good hint when uh, some lengthy operation has finished. Um, and, we, and we encourage programmers to use certain con constructs that many objects, most objects would normally not escape, even if they go beyond one thread. And that's where this kind of escape detection could work and that is something very interesting and something that I'm sure people at the GC team will be looking into uh, separately from the SAP allocation issue. That's well, Ron, um, you know, just to make a comment here, I think, um, you know, I mean, I understand the problems that you're trying to solve and I think they're, it, it's, they're really kind of fun, but um, in terms of the larger problems, um, you know, what we see, you, what you said is right. We can't get Java developers to change how they write code. code. And right now the state of how they write code is, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to say the least. There's lots of opportunities for improvement. Um, one of the, uh, you know, one of the major costs, and, and this is like actually a hidden cost to uh, many, many of the applications that we run into is simply allocation pressure translating down into um, you, know, you know this uh, bandwidth pressure issue that 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 is trying to be solved and uh, you know I'm, I'm, I myself am you know not sure of all of the issues that stack allocation presents to you as you try to do your work um, so that you know that's something that would be more interesting to learn about uh, but you know what I'm what I'm looking for, and you know what I was looking for when I was talking to, initially talking to Charlie and Cliff and Thomas about 
about the escape analysis, analysis picture was just simply trying to get better escape analysis so that we could do things to reduce uh, the bandwidth pressure. Now, you know, so obviously I'd still like to see that work be done um, because I think there's potential, there's tremendous opportunities for performance improvements, like, you know, the uh, integer like performance improvements that Cliff is talking about, you know, I personally witnessed them, you know, like 4X is when you go into places is uh, for some, for a number of applications is not uncommon. It's a very common number to see, right? Right, but that's going away with the HUD, right? So that's, that, that particular thing is just going to disappear. What, the, the bandwidth pressure? How? No, the integer, the integer, the integer case. No, no, we're talking about integer factor speed up. Integer factor oh, speed up. Oh, all right, yeah. Yeah, like the program got four times faster. This is, yeah, this we're, we're, number. we're you, this is seriously what I would call one of the biggest hidden bottlenecks that hits just about every application that we run into today is this bandwidth issue. And this is why I was telling you that before you proceed down one path or another, do some bandwidth measurements and see what the potential gains might be. Because I think they're freaking huge. I think that GC okay. costs you a huge amount of overhead that is hidden because it only shows up in the bandwidth. Right. So, I mean, we get GC logs thrown at us from just about everywhere. I mean, I got literally thousands upon thousands of GC logs that I go through. And I would say that at least 60% of them are, you look at the application, you can quickly identify the, um, the primary bottleneck is allocation pressure, just from the GC log, right? And that's like 60% of the applications that have people- you, Have you seen, have, is, that, is that for example with, uh, we're getting a bit technical, uh, but is, is that for example with uh, G1 in JDK 15? It or has nothing to do with the garbage collector. This is purely, yeah. Application memory efficiency. No, I'm, yes, it's just that uh, I know G1 handles a very, very high allocation rate. So the, the, no, 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 it's, not the, it's not the garbage collector. It's really yeah. just the allocation itself. Right. The garbage it's collector was very efficient. Uh, you know, yeah. C4 was very efficient. Uh, ZGC looks like it's very good. You know, I don't really have any complaints about Shenandoah. These developers are developing very nicely. It's not a garbage collection issue. It's pure, simple, somebody going into a for loop and just saying like new object, you know, like a billion times, like really fast. So, so, so an example, suppose you have an infinite memory and the fall off the cliff GC that takes zero cycles and never runs because you have infinite memory. You get a 4X speed up if you do something smarter with allocation. It is unrelated to GC in any way. Right. Okay. So it's not the garbage, it's the allocation. Right. So, um, um, yeah. And so, and so really the, the, the key to, 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 to resolving that is just simply getting better escape analysis, right? The stack allocation, if that helps, you know, cool. The, the goal of stack allocation is to reduce that memory bandwidth cost by having you recycle the L2 cache to hold new objects repeatedly instead of streaming through. Yeah, so and that's, that's why we're really supporting the work of, of Nicola and Charlie in this case is because they've done a lot of work examining um, the, 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 you know, the escape analysis and how that fits into, into stack allocation. And I think they've come up with a huge number of opportunities to improve um, in, in that area. So you, you just get better scalar replacement, you get better escape analysis, you get better inlining, you get, you know, just things get better. Yeah, so uh, that is right. So I think we should separate the uh, escape detection from the escape analysis and stack allocation. Uh, those are, so the first is related to, to garbage collection more and the second uh, is, has an effect on memory bandwidth for allocation. Um, right, and of course, uh, Valhalla would have an effect on, effect on allocation, right? Um, because that will, in fact, all inline objects will be stack allocated, if at all. Um, yeah, so, um, right, so, so now the, the, the question is, how much does that, uh, does, that, uh, so, does that kind of stack allocation help? 
and um, how exactly we should do it. So to go down the question of how much, I'm, I was proposing, still proposing, a, answer the limit question. In the limit, what happens? Where the limit is somehow I've cut my bandwidth in half or maybe by you know 90%, something ridiculous. What, what does that do for me? And I think you'll find that it does a lot and you're not gonna get 90%, so you need to dig deeper. But if you start there and it comes up and the limit answer is, doesn't do shit, well then this is all like wasted time. There's no, no gain to be had. But I think it does a whole lot. I, you know, for, you know, one of the pieces of work that we did in, in London, uh, you know, doing FPML work, um, you sort of came up like a sort of like a power curve. And it looked like, you know, the, the, the real steep part of the power curve was above one, uh, one uh, gig per second before it started tailing off, right? And in this case, you know, we, we started about 400,000 TPS. We eventually ended up with 25 million TPS, right? And the bulk of that gain was done um, just getting below the one gig limit. And after that, you know, you, you start tailing off on the curve uh, quite quickly. Uh, so, Cliff, I have a question. Um, so, the kind of uh, stack allocation proposal that's currently on the table, uh, namely one that takes place only inside a single N method, um, how much of a difference between that and what you try to do you think there is? Um, what I got working well uh only went up two frames in practice that was the zero one two heap number so that a little bit of inlining would limit you to one in method pretty successfully so i think it, you could get to a it's just this one method but i need to do some more inlining in places where the jit's not currently inlining the other thing you had to do is you have to deal with loops and uh loops kind of sort of want a frame like behavior that you reset every iteration around the loop. Uh, I think, I think that uh, Charlie and Nikolai's, uh, Nikolai's proposal sort of does that. It, it just has one copy of an object. Is that, is that true, Nikolai? There's no, nothing to do with what I've heard so far. Uh, about loops? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we, we only pick selected amount of objects to stack allocate in loops those that we can prove do not escape the loop. Yeah. If they do, we just abandon them because oh. all of all sorts of issues. But you reuse them in each iteration. Yeah. So we reuse the same object in iteration if we can actually prove that it does not escape the loop. If it does escape at least the loop iteration, then, you know, you, for example, if you had an embedded constructor inside the loop, that will just damage your object because it's uh, earlier version of the object in the loop and you we want to use it, game over. Compares is, is another one. If you want to compare pointer to pointer, that doesn't no longer works. Um, because often the code would just say, if I'm the same object, then I can do this, else do that. And you break that sort of um, assumption. But so we have this logic to detect that. Might be a bit too complicated at the moment and we're looking for a better way. The escape detection strategy says it hasn't escaped. I detect that it is not, and therefore I can continue to, uh, uh, you know, do the right things with it throughout the loop body, uh, and then recognize at the end of the loop that it is in fact dead, yeah. and reset and go again. And that's the that's the gain to be had there. It, it's instead of giving up on some count and escape analysis on others. The escape analysis ones come cheap. The ones that fail escape analysis get stacked, get heap allocated somewhere, and that's your bandwidth. And that's the bandwidth in a loop, and that's where all your volume of allocations go. Yeah, just for the context. Uh, so nowadays at Azul, we do aggressive uh, escape analysis. Uh, we do control flow sensitive analysis. We do special tricks around this uh, boxing uh, cases. And uh, we 
do have uh, some inlining heuristics to, uh, to encourage inlining in the cases where we would uh, extend the scope for escape analysis. And I would say the work around escape analysis and scalarization was one of the bigger um, improvements we've seen, let's say in the last like year, two years. So definitely big gains to be had. Uh, we don't do stack allocation today. Uh, we consider stack allocation as a way to, uh, to improve robustness of our, uh, of our optimizations. Because yeah, currently if we fail to, uh, to do escape analysis and scalarization, we just have an allocation and uh, don't have anything. If we cannot scalarize, but we can still prove that it doesn't escape, we view this as a uh, gradual way to, okay, we cannot scalarize, scalarize in full, but we can stack allocate. Uh, but that's something we, we consider but don't yet do. So you're tracking through some set of things that could be stack allocated that you're not actually doing any stacky things with. You're just uh, well, our escape analysis can tell that the thing does not uh, does not escape from from the method, but we cannot scalarize in some cases. Let's say when we have this uh, merge of unescaped object and something else, but we prove that the merge also doesn't escape the uh, the function. Yeah. So somewhere after the merge, you do a a memory operation on a pointer instead of using an in register value, which is fine. Then. Yeah, but as I said, we have, uh, we have special optimization around box cases, so they, they are not a, such a pain point for us. Uh, specifically, we do aggressive uh, full redundancy elimination. So if we see a load from, uh, from a merge, uh, we know that on, if all incoming values into the merge uh, have, the, have the value available, if it's a new allocation, we just have a store. Uh, if it is a load from the cache, we know the value uh, from the cache. So we do this kind of propagation and replace the load with a phi of, um, of the underlying value. Uh, I think the trick Ron suggested was replacing the, uh, the cache value with scalarized. Uh, I think it violates the identity of the object. So you might replace uh, an object from the cache with, uh, like with yeah, if you scalar replace it, uh, later, you might uh, end up with different result of comparison of a reference. Uh, so there's something to um, to be careful about. Yeah. Well, if you but if you want to access the reference, then you're not scalar replacing to begin with. You do the scalar replacement only when you don't access the reference. Uh, well, let's say consider a case where you have um, like hash map get of uh, of a boxed integer. Uh, you would have a reference comparison uh, with what is in the hash map, but uh, you can actually optimize it knowing that if it is a new allocation, the reference equality will never be true, but for cached value, it may be true. Ah. Okay. How about not surface reference identity in the first place? But no, we're not doing language changes here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Except we are. <laughs> Well, okay. I, I'm not proposing any language level change. I propose not cutting my foot off. <laughs> Sounds like a great plan. Now, go back in time 20 years and stand up in front of Galad Braca. Oh, hey, Galad was a trick. Okay, fine. Uh, it's a cat that's not going back in the bag. So. Yes. I got my cat not going back in the bag. He's like mad at me because I'm not paying him any attention. Wrong cat. Yeah, object identity. Um, you track it too. That keeps adding up things that cause fails. But uh, I don't know if you've seen, but we're going to start emitting warnings on those. Um, oh yeah? We're, we are actually changing the semantics in a backward uh, incompatible way, but hopefully one that will not uh, annoy too many people. What, what, what particular, what warning are you, when are you giving warning? Let me find it. Uh, I, I make Sentinel objects all the time, but just, you know, new object, now it's a Sentinel. Is this where you have the two replacement interfaces for object or whatever? Um, yeah, it has to, uh, we're going to start this allowed. Yeah, here it is. Uh, identity warnings. Yeah, so it's, um, I'm not sure if uh, my microphone is working. Yeah, it's, it for, is. it's for classes that, I, as I understand it, it's for classes that are explicitly marked in the Java doc as you should not rely on the identity of this object. 
those are going to have warnings added for them as far as I understand. Okay. And what classes are those? Give me a sample class. Right. So um, they're going to be, so I posted a link, but they're all the number classes. So, uh, in, so, so uh, they're all the box classes, byte short, integer, long, float, double, okay, boolean, right. character, yeah. uh, optional date, uh, the date ones, all the date ones, uh, some of the list ones actually. Yes. And in fact, uh, you won't be able to synchronize oh, no. them. Yes. So we are actually going 20 years back and changing Java. So. That will break a few apps. Uh, sure. Uh, but we've decided that uh, if it happens uh, to, to a moderate degree, we're okay with that. It'll break, it'll break a few Oracle apps. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, wait, I'm ready, to, ready to watch the, the fireworks here. Well, I, I know that there are some um, uh, some sharding approaches that that do uh, uh, use use the integer cache or some similar cache like that as a, a synchronization object cache. Oh, we have we have much bigger trouble coming coming up much sooner, and sooner I mean a matter of weeks. So this is this is not going to bother anyone in the in the short term. Well, send us a link. I want to watch the fireworks. <laughs> Now it's going to be the uh, default access, default illegal access, which is going to be disabled, I hope, in a matter of weeks. Uh, so what? The default illegal ac access, uh, reflective access into the JDK, that's going to be disabled in, in a matter of weeks. Oh, you mean like I can't turn off whatever. There's always the, the funny game with reflection where you had to just do it twice, whatever. Turn off the, you can't do it, and then turn off the... Yes, exactly, yes. So uh, that's going away very, very, very soon. Um, well, well, as long as you don't backport that to JDK8, everyone will be fine. Exactly. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, I just redid my machine, so I redid my JDK on the machine and went back and forth and decided I could probably install 11, maybe, but I'm not, I'm not touching all kinds of forward stuff just to, never mind, doesn't do me any, doesn't do, help me at all. It's all good. All right. Well, the, the new model is to bundle your runtime with your application anyways. Yeah, yeah. So there's no more one JDK on the machine. Yeah, yeah. Or JRE. Yeah, yeah, yeah. JRE is still getting bigger. I mean, memory or whatever, disk footprint's still getting bigger, or whatever, disks are still getting bigger. So comes a point where you can just say, I don't care no more. Well, the runtime's not that large. Java does a pretty good job with the uh, packaging. Yep. And so the footprint, so uh, actually JDK 8. Uh, some say uh, we, we haven't reached an agreement whether it was eight or nine, but in one of those uh, Java reached uh, peak bloat, both in terms of image size and footprint size. And even if you run an existing application on, on the current JDK, was it 14 or 15, uh, you'll see that your footprint is going to be drastically lower than an eight. Um, and it's just, it, and it's shrinking with every version. Okay. <laughs> See if it keeps shrinking. That seems a little unlikely, but maybe. Uh, no, it's mostly about um, returning returning uh, unused uh, memory to the OS. <laughs> so it's it's not really it's not that the, your application actually uses like a bit of it. We some of the big changes were to uh, strings. The way strings aren't represented. Um, so that was a big change in nine. Uh, so that actually changed how much RAM the application is consuming. Uh, and but then since then it's been mostly uh, returning returning memory more promptly to the OS. Yeah, and the, and also the lazy allocation of arrays and the container types was a huge huge win on memory usage. I think that was in eight or nine. We did an analysis with a bunch of the Oracle applications, and some of them were chewing up like twenty gigabytes with empty arrays. It was amazing. I've watched like numbers, numbers you just can't believe. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Very common. You see, sometimes the easy stuff can buy you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. I think that's kind of also the point of why I'm kind of interested in the stack 
stack based allocation technology well i'm interested for a different reason because i want to see what it can do for um passing structs by value to native functions and you want to do that maybe cheaply allocate the struct instead of going to malloc um but you know e even with inline classes from valhalla it requires people to rewrite some of their code rewrite some of their classes um well, maybe this can do something for code that is already out there. You just upgrade the runtime and it runs faster. So I think that's uh, good as well. But I, I should I should also say that I'm by no means a, a C2 expert. Um, I'm just interested in technology and learning more uh, about it. Yeah. Good luck. Because C2 is a funny beast. It's been around a long time, used by bazillions of people, and it's still not necessarily the mainstream compiler tech. But it's a popular compiler. So Cliff, any, any uh, have you ever experimented with this, um, you know, the stuff that's not necessarily, where you can't necessarily prove it's not going to escape, but it generally generally doesn't escape? Have you, have you considered using a reference counting implementation just for that? slice of data? Uh, um, I mean, when we started on this path, we looked at all these things right in the beginning. And then we did the, let's go, let's go count escapes and discovered things were strongly normalizing. And then I said, okay, I'm not going to deal with reference counting. There are definitely lots and lots of papers that people gotten very aggressive with reference counting um, in terms of aggressively reducing the cost of reference counting by discovering regions where they can count one item at the head of the region and know mm -hmm. that it covers everyone underneath and so on and so forth. I did not go down that path. You know, once I said, hey, if I just inlined a little bit more, I got these things stack local within the method, method local even, method stack, um, you know, now, now I should be doing escape analysis. And I never finished that piece, but I got there, you know, sort of without having to deal with reference counting. And in particular, I didn't need to deal with having uh, reference counts everywhere I have sort of read barriers or write barriers. I guess it's read barriers. I ended up with only write barriers. No, no reason. And also, uh, I think, yeah, right, the point, the point here isn't to be perfect, right? So you, you just want to get your uh, allocation rate below uh, the point where you saturate the, the bandwidth. And, and once you're below saturation, you're fine. I mean, there's no point making things even better. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It, it, the saturation has a curve, but as Kirk was pointing out, once you get down below some point in the curve, you're done. Uh, but you got you to gotta drive it down a ways. Um, it's still a case that one core can basically soak the bandwidth directly by furiously allocating. And that is still a fairly common Java pattern, Java programmer pattern. Sometimes yeah, well, without realizing that's what they're doing. They no, no clue. That's what I was thinking, Cliff was, and, and Ron, you know, if you had a, say, a, a common loop um, style issue where you'd have say 99% of the items not escape and that 1% escaping. So I'm thinking, you know, some of the stream use cases in Java, for example, or, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm map filtering or something like that. You know, the ones that I'm only using once, so an allocation for, for example, that I'm only using once some concatenation or something like that, you know, one of them will escape, right? So, or, or maybe some small set of them that escape, depending on the use case. You know, if, if, if all of your working set were in your stack, so almost guaranteed to be pinned in your L2, you know, if the, if, if the uh, if you use the reference count mechanism to know, to basically detect in the loop when it does escape, you know, you'd, you'd basically, yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to copy, but you'd have to copy in that 1% of cases as opposed to. Well, well uh, the, the escape detection also has you escaped, I have to copy. So it's, some of it is the cost to detect. Some of it is when do I detect? So with the escape detection, I detect you at the moment of escape because you stored outside some boundary. And the cost is a write barrier, related to the write barrier. 
with the reference count, you have to drive, the, it's a read barrier, you have to drive that cost down because reads are five times more common than writes. So you have to drive that cost down and it typically is a load modify store uh, and a compare as opposed to a uh, integer math bit test jump. So, you know, I'm not saying it's the right or wrong answer. I'm saying on the surface, right as I stare at it, it has some more overhead to get rid of. It has a higher, more difficult starting point to make a win. If the win is a giant bandwidth win and I don't care, then maybe it's an easier implementation and I'm all happy. But my experience on that was I had to drive costs down of the barrier and a more expensive read barrier is going to make me have to drive more costs down. That we was still necessary to drive those costs down. I was thinking of a, just a, a check on the trailing edge of the loop, for example. Right. So, so your thesis is that we can analyze the loop body, discover that it is, will not escape except this guy who I want to reference count and discover that he doesn't. And so I'm doing an escape analysis. It's almost successful. I make it successful by adding a runtime test. The runtime test has a, you know, add, subtract, compare, whatever, because it's rough counting. And the issue there is that everyone else in the loop that could be adding pointers or subtracting to pointers to this guy has to also be ref counting. So all those costs have to be driven down somehow. And that was the goal of the big ref counting work was to discover code regions where I didn't need to ref count. Um, there's a bunch of papers on those that are fairly old. I don't know that it ever hit a hot spot level of, of people using it. I know that there were some folks who claimed it looked good. It was certainly not, it was not the obvious performance fail of the ref counting of your, but I don't know how far it went. Okay. Well, the other thing is the, the biggest cost on the ref counting was the, the multi-threaded aspect of it. You know, so once, once you have it single thread only. I'm talking single thread cost. If you go multi-thread on ref counting, boy, you suck bad. Yeah, you're screwed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're single threaded, you're still doing a, a you know, load ink store. Um, which x86 is pretty cheap with and a compare branch, but that's yeah, not so cheap. so loading store in L1 is zero cycles. Um it burns it burns processor bits. The, the the difference is I don't actually have to dirty even an L1 line on the other one where I'm actually taking two pointers, doing an and instruction. Two pointers I have in registers already because I have to have in registers, and I do an and operation and a bit test and jump. So I would claim half of zero. You know, it's half the cost of the loading store, assuming the guy does the right things, which he probably does with you. If you don't have a whole lot of store barriers, uh, rights going on, he probably does the right thing. But you still have to do that on loads is my understanding. Although if the, I guess not, I guess if the analysis for the loop body is successful. So this is a, a, essentially a variation of escape analysis on a loop body that was successful down to a handful of things. I, I think, Cameron, that what, what you're suggesting, you, you don't really need uh, reference counting. You just need a bit to tell you that maybe I've escaped. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the issue being that you had to store the bit if you had an escape, a maybe escape event. And so how many different places have to store the bit? This is like, um, I'm doing this with, uh, when I did generational, I was doing it with uh, write, uh, standard store write buffer, or whatever. Uh, uh, Guarded right, guarded card mark. Uh, it's very similar kinds of- only, only on assignment, in other words. But only on assignment, not on reads, yeah. So I'm not saying it's not a win or a lose directly, but the, the obvious cost, you have, to, you have to beat the win of read versus write, you have to beat the win of compare two pointers versus uh, uh, do a memory operation. Compare two pointers, to registers as opposed to memory operations. So it's zero cost if you have enough memory uh, uh, cycles floating around or enough uh, L, whatever, load store units, which maybe you do. You know, it, it's, it's, it, I claim it's a higher cost, but it's not necessarily above the threshold that I care. I have a thing I have to go do at 1230. So um, I, I'm going to wrap here pretty shortly. If anyone wants to say something, do it now. I'm just disappointed that Matt didn't share five 
great articles about <laughs> reference counting when yeah, you were talking. What what happened? <laughs> he's, he's not coming back, so he's not even on. <laughs> it's all good. Oh, he says he's just listening today. Okay, he is on. It's all good. Because you were uh, talking, you were talking about reference counting papers, and I was watching the chat. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, there's some good papers out there. Is there such a thing as a good reference counting? There, there are. No, there's a bunch of good work that's mm -hmm. now kind of old, like 15 years or something, where a couple guys tried really hard to drive down reference counting costs by doing escape analysis kind of like things, sort of. And got, got it pretty far down. It was kind of, uh, they had an implementation that was sensible on some funny language. I don't remember what. Um, they, they drove it pretty hard. Uh, yeah, because in theory, Kirk's Kirk's uh, twenty five, whatever, twenty five yeah. gigs a second example or whatever. Sorry, Kirk, if I'm messing up your your example, but I mean, you can without changing the crappy code, reference counting used wisely could actually fix that entire problem. I don't think so. That's again, it's not a GC problem. It's a pure, you know, burn the I hear you, but if you're not burning anything because it's all in the same place, then the problem goes away. Yeah, it's the same story as stack allocation. It's, 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 it's an allocation issue. I think we're confused. No, no, no. Yeah, but if allocation costs zero because of analysis or because of a single bit costs. check. No, no, it does. This is the reason we're talking about stack allocation for bandwidth removal. Same story. Allocation can cost zero, trust me. <laughs> you're, you're reallocating the same virtual storage that's in the same L2 cache line that you were using just a little while ago, so you never touch memory bandwidth. Okay, it can be cheap, right? Don't believe it can be zero. Well, the, the costs are always the direct costs of the allocation. In the case of ref counting, there's the direct ref counting costs, which the discussion is how low can you drive it? It got driven lower than maybe people would expect by some papers done 15 years ago. I'm now attempting to, um, uh, now attempting to look by doing Google Scholar. This is where Matt would, you know. Matt already posted one. Oh, he did it already? Oh, you beat me to it? No, so, not, so I killed but, but Kirk, Kirk, if you, had, if you had analysis that told you that something did not escape, so escape analysis, it says it does not escape this loop. It cannot get past the curly brace, maybe without an exception or what, like there's some, yeah. At that point, you can you, you can allocate it on the entry into the frame. I mean, you can make the frame size big enough to hold it. You can you don't even need a V table at that point, right? Like you know what the type is, so you have function calls instead of indirect calls. Like you have like at that at that point, it literally goes to zero. It, it's I you know read I agree with you. There's uh, huge cost reductions, but zero is you're still doing something. So that's well, it, it depends on the type. Not, but but if, if it's not a variable length type, it it could go to zero. Okay. Let, let's yeah yeah yeah. I mean, I mean the, the the interesting factor is the order of magnitude of bandwidth can be removed via ref counting, same as can be removed via stack allocation. I think Cameron, you, you mean that the uh, allocation cost is swallowed by the mutation cost. So if if you if you assign three to an int, yeah. then the cost of allocating it on the stack is zero, and and that's true. Yeah. So if that's yes. what you, that that can go to zero. That would be a a very simple example. Yeah. But I'm saying, let's say I have a some sort of structure I allocate in a loop, hammer it a few times inside the loop to do something, and then. You know, maybe I pass it to a, a foo that does something with the structure and it comes back, you know, so it's not escaping foo, it's not escaping my loop. I can inline foo around the struct, you know, so every time through the loop, I don't have to new it, I don't have to delete it, I don't have to reference count it, I, yes. you know. Scale replacement. Yeah, that's what scale replacement is. <laughs> right, yeah. okay. Yeah. So there, that, those, right, so we're talking about things that are a little more complicated that you can't get rid of directly. But you can then show maybe with ref counting or stack allocation, uh, escape analysis, detection, whatever, that it didn't escape the lifetime. So when you allocate a, a shape of the object, you still fill it in your cache and then you passed it to somebody who did something with it was at a memory shape and then they, they were done and you reclaim the cache and then you redid it for the next loop. You're only using the same cache lines. There's no bandwidth costs, but you're still doing loads and storage. Yeah. I think that's what I'm referring to. 
Okay. Yeah, the yeah. yeah. So the we're, we're, cost is is, but you know the as you know the bandwidth cost is you know. Uh, really enormous the cost compared to the cost of just like the reuse in the cash line. I mean that's trivial. Right. So we're trying to get rid of the bandwidth costs, and yes. the question is, can Ruffin? I don't have a paper handy. I googled for thirty seconds. I didn't find them. They're out I, there. I'd be interested in reading that one. Um, like well, if somebody wants to drag them up for next time or throw them up on Twitter, I am going to. I'm going to have to bail here shortly. Either way, um, and we have you know, grist for the mill next go round. Um, okay, so this has been very fun. Um, I think it's been informative for me, certainly, and hopefully for everybody. Uh, and I do this every week, and I'll send you an email next week. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah. Thanks, Cliff. All right. Bye bye.